<laughs> Welcome everyone to Gatsby Unbound. Uh, this is a webinar in which we are going to consider the future of an American masterpiece, The Great Gatsby, now that it is officially out of copyright. I'm Maureen Corrigan. I'm the Nikki and Jamie Grant Distinguished Professor of the Practice in Literary Criticism at Georgetown. And this event is brought to you by the Georgetown Dean's Office and Georgetown's Department of English. Um, I should also say I'm also the author of So We Read On, which is a book that considers what F. Scott Fitzgerald thought he was doing in writing The Great Gatsby and why this book that was not out of print, but really hard to get at the time of F. Scott Fitzgerald's death, um, why that book has endured and flourished and attained the status in our reading culture that it has. I'm really delighted to introduce this amazing panel um, of Gatsby lovers and Gatsby experts who, who are assembled today. So first of all, Michael Cody. Michael Cody is a director and producer. I had the pleasure of uh, attending Michael's production of The Great Gatsby that he directed a few years ago at Northwestern University. Michael is also working on his own adaptation of The Great Gatsby for the stage. And Michael is also the producer of Hashtag Enough, which is an initiative to end gun violence by inviting teenagers to write their own plays that speak to the issue of gun violence and in, with the hope that, that that will spark conversation and real change in their communities. Blake Hazard is a musician. She is also a trustee of the Fitzgerald estate and she is the great granddaughter of Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald. And among other things, Blake is here to talk about the beautiful new graphic novel of The Great Gatsby that Scribner's has produced this year. And Ni Vo is the author of two novellas and her debut novel, The Chosen and the Beautiful came out this summer. It's an, invent an inventive reimagining of The Great Gatsby as told not by Nick Carraway, but by Jordan Baker. And Ni Vo's Jordan Baker is a queer Asian woman uh, navigating the difficult terrain of America in the 1920s. I expect that we will have a spirited conversation for about 45 minutes. And then I want to invite all of the attendees, please, to post your questions in the chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. So welcome everybody and thank you for, for being with me here at Georgetown where um, Blake, I think, your great great grandfather attended Georgetown briefly. He didn't graduate, but according to the records, we've got Edward Fitzgerald on the rolls. So um, I'll, I'll have to share that document with you if you're not aware of it. <laughs> Please do. I, it sounds like I should be aware of yeah, that. I yeah. did not know. I, I did not know that. You know? I, it's, it's, it's a distant memory bank somewhere, maybe, yeah. but that's really very cool yeah. and interesting. Yeah. <laughs> There are, there are always new things to discover, right? Um, I want to start by asking all three of you a question, and that is, what was your first reading of The Great Gatsby like? Michael, I'll throw it to you first. Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you, Maureen, for bringing us together for this. It's really it's exciting always to nerd out about The Great Gatsby. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think I'm part of a you know, generation where really, where we encounter it in high school, where it's part of a core curriculum, where, you know, I can't remember if it's junior, senior, or high school, you're reading the book, and you're writing about the green light, and you're writing about the meaning behind T.J. Eckelberg, and you're, you're doing all the essays about the, the symbolism in the novel. So I think that was certainly my first encounter, and it wouldn't be, honestly, so that's 2003, 2004, that honestly, it would be until 2016 when I directed the production that I would return back to it, that I hadn't touched it for uh, over a decade. And um, it really, you know, reading it from a different point in my life and reading it um, with this task of mounting a production, um, but also um, not being burdened with uh, being sort of drilled on like, what are these, sim like, what do the symbols mean? And what did Fitzgerald mean? And really, uh, having the opportunity to experience it fresh again. Um, that felt like my first reading of Great Gatsby, 
was in 2016 for real. Yeah, yeah. Blake, you have you have a singular experience. <laughs> I do. I mean, strangely, I was not taught Fitzgerald at all in school, not in undergrad. And I had actually wondered if it was by design in high school or, you know, in earlier years, I wondered if, you know, did my mother call and say, please don't do that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't actually think that she did, but um, uh, so I got to come to the text on my, on my own. I just got to enjoy it. I mean, we were, we met earlier with Maureen's seminar, uh, Fitzgerald seminar, which was wonderful. Her students are so cool and thoughtful and I loved their questions. It was really fun. Um, and now I'm wondering why I'm bringing that up, except that um, and now I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, they had great questions and I just got to come to the book by myself. Oh, now I remember what I was saying, which is that, you know, they asked why we chose to work with Gatsby. They asked the three of us. Yeah. And I said, of course, you know, I'm a family member. And so that's how I originally um, came to be involved with the estate. I was honored to be asked, but really I have invested so much of my own time and passion into this um, because I am genuinely a fan. And I think some of that genuine fandom came from coming to the text on my own and not being pressured to read it, not through my family, not through school, um, and not even having sort of heavy lessons about what the symbolism is supposed to mean to me or anything like that. I just came to it with my own um, genuine appreciation as a reader. So, uh, I, and my mother was the same. She also read on her own. She wasn't pressured by her mother to read Fitzgerald at all. And so we both, I think, got to come to the, the joy of the text ourselves. But I'm grateful for that, actually. Yeah, that's wonderful. Me, nee, you're. Uh, high school in central Illinois. And it made an impression because the very day we started, I was nearly hit by a car in the school parking lot. So a brief brush with death, plus all of the huge emotions of being 14 and convinced that, you know, I was both simultaneously immortal and incredibly, incredibly fragile sort of shaped how I entered the text and always has. You know, I can't help but think, oh, symbolism come to life. You know, cars <laughs> play such a huge role in The Great Gatsby and there you it's are. It's when metaphors <laughs> turn deadly, basically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, wow, uh, we could spend the rest of this conversation thinking about that and, and the symbolism, but Blake, I, I, I really would like you to speak to the issue of copyright, because I feel like copyright is one of those concepts that I think I know what it means, and you know, you've got the legal background now. I, I, explain it to us. What does it mean for the great Gatsby to be out of copyright? Uh, well, for Gatsby to be out of copyright means that if it, since it does not enjoy copyright protection, it's in the public domain. Mm -hmm. um, things come out of copyright and into, I mean, the way things get copyright is very simple in a way. I mean, if it's original and it's fixed in some form, it sort of, it immediately gets a copyright. If you write a song and you record it on your phone, the moment of fixation creates copyright. So um, creating copyright is not um, as complicated, but when uh, so through the years, uh, copyright has enjoyed different um, extensions. It was um, a copyright act of 76 change did anything before 78, uh, enjoys copyright for 95 years after the date of publication. Anything after that, it's 70 years after the author's life. I, I, just, I guess you could say their death. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so you can see that they're, the legislation is kind of contemplating that these works should remain protected after the life of the author, given that it's 95 years and then 70 years after. So, um, and, I mean, that, that's kind of interesting. I, I would love to talk about that. But when you say, what does it mean that it's under copyright or, that, or what, what happened when it was under copyright, what kind of rights a work uh, enjoys and th those are you know adaptive rights derivative rights distributed you know reproduction rights um, so meaning somebody else couldn't publish other than the publisher that's working with you know under copyright um, uh, you know making film and tv adaptations you need to have permissions basically to do those things mm -hmm. so until Gatsby came out of copyright um, which was January 2021 so it's 95 years after date of publication um, people would have needed to come to, to us essentially and ask permission um, to do any adaptations or prequels, sequels, things like that um, because it was under copyright. I hope I answered that. Yeah. So, so, you know, the question that's probably in, in everyone's mind is 
well, what now? Are the gates wide open? Are we going to have porno Gatsby? Are we going to have, you know, Godzilla Gatsby? Can anything happen? Do you, is there any say uh, that the estate has or, or Scribner's as the original publisher has over what can be done? I mean, I think we still can, well, yes and no. I would say in terms of things being in the public domain in the, in the United States, you really sky's the limit now, I would say with, with Gatsby, people can do kind of as they wish with the text. Um, copyright is, varies internationally. There are some countries where uh, Gatsby is still under copyright, um, but that's, I think you're really asking, you know, here in, in the States, can somebody kind of do uh, what they want, they can. I mean, I think there are some limitations and I, and, I, and if I'm at being asked the exact legal parameters, mm -hmm. I do not exactly know. Um, but there certainly um, is the possibility for us to be involved and maybe sort of, um, I guess you could say authorize or um, mm -hmm. have a role that's maybe somewhat official, which I think the benefit of that is just how is helping to maintain the integrity of the text is really what our goal is. So um, to the extent that we're, we're involved in those kinds of things, um, people would only need our permission to get our participation, but they don't, they can do what they want. That's okay. Nice. <laughs> what, what do we know that's, that's coming about? Like what's coming out? I, I've heard, uh, you know, a musical uh, is in the works. I've heard a BBC, I think, um, TV show about Fitzgerald's life and, and Gatsby, or maybe I'm, maybe I dreamt that up. I don't know. <laughs> there are, I, there are some things I, unfortunately, like I'm not hundred percent sure what I'm allowed to say, okay. just the things that I'm aware of that I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about, but you're, you're right that there was a kind of BBC oriented version, yeah. um, which has been sort of sold, rethought, and I'm not totally sure what's happening. And yes, there is a very cool, I think, musical in the works. Yeah. Again, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about it. Oh no, that's that's come out, right? That Florence Welsh is doing, um, yes, that's been in the, okay. in, uh, I think that'll be really cool. Um, we're not directly involved, but they were very respectful and reached out to us about it. Um, but there could be any number of things that we're not aware of at this point. And I, so I don't have like a, yeah. a list, we may be surprised. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Wow, I, it's it's such a it's such a complicated issue because on the one hand, I think you know I, I'll speak for myself as someone who loves Gatsby deeply. I want to keep that language the way it is, <laughs> you know. And on the other hand, I was inspired to write my book to think more deeply about Gatsby by going to see Gats, the seven and a half hour off Broadway production of, of The Great Gatsby that did preserve the language, but that set the novel in a 1970s office, you know? And when I heard the description of what the production was about, I was like, really? But I went and I was blown away and it opened up so many different possibilities for how to read Gatsby to me that I would not have had otherwise. So ah, deeply mixed. Uh, Michael, I wanna ask you, you, you had the experience of working within the framework of directing the one, at the time, the one authorized version of The Great Gatsby that could be put on stage. And then with the challenge of how do I make this my own? So I wonder if, if you might want to talk about that and also show us some slides from your production. Yeah, sure. So I'll give some context first. So uh, this was a third year project uh, at Northwestern University where I got my master's. And um, you know, one of the core tenets of that program is this idea of um, honing and owning and establishing your directorial point of view. Not meaning like you're going to lay a concept on top of a production and and somehow it's new and fresh, but that you're one 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 instructor of mine describes it as like where where your blood meets the blood of the the play, or where like if the if the play was laid out as a bunch of metal shards and it's all part of the play, and you put your particular magnet over it, the <laughs> first shards that hit that magnet are like the most primary in your reading of that work, and it's with that sort of metaphorical thinking that we uh, approach uh, these plays, whether it's a new play or whether it's a known work like Shakespeare or whether it's an adaptation. It's like, where do I meet this work? Um, so the adaptation that well, was available at the time 
um, was uh, Simon Levy's adaptation came out in 2006, uh, premiered at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, which is pretty apropos for Fitzgerald. <laughs> um, and, uh, and my production was in 2016. And so in between there, you also have the 2013 Baz Luhrmann film. So there's a, there's a number of things that as a director entering an adaptation of a well-known book that I'm kind of up against. One, um, Simon Levy has his own point of view in how he adapted the book and what he, was primary in his reading. So primary in, in his reading was um, the, the romance between Gatsby and Daisy mm -hmm. and also um, wanting to make the characters that feel elusive in the reading of the book a little bit more grounded. So bringing more text to Daisy by actually drawing on uh, Zelda Fitzgerald's uh, letters to Scott. Um, and then you, you have this visual um, definition of the book that's been made by Baz Luhrmann in a huge movie that so many people saw. And now you're like, this is what Gatsby looks like. It feels like, it sounds like, how do you jump into doing a production of that? Um, and so two things started to shape my uh, production early on. First was going back to the book and being really, you know, in the, in, in the adaptation, Nick Carraway is a storyteller. He's a narrator, really trying to know why he, he's telling the story. In, in, in any play that I see where there's a, a first person narrator or someone talking directly to the audience, I always wanna know like, why? Who am I? Why, why are we here as part of this event? Um, and then also it was, it was honestly coming across um, Maureen's book. So we read on and certain elements of it that she, she pulled out that I hadn't read in my first uh, initial reading of the book. So this idea of Nick is, will spend the rest of his life thinking about that sum with Gatsby. That Nick is like the, um, the uh, I have it written down here, the uh, jazz age Ishmael that survives to tell the tale, the imagery of water that's this running thread through, um, through uh, Fitzgerald's work. And then also this idea that uh, Fitzgerald is, uh, you know, the, the feeling, I'm gonna quote directly, the feeling of being at home in his own skin of being enough in terms of class or talent was a utopian state that Fitzgerald never attained. And I just like, those things really resonated for me personally, but also in my reading of Gatsby and in the way these characters interact with each other, the why Gatsby would create such a persona for himself, mm -hmm. um, the supposed indifference among people to tragedy and um, the insecurities of Tom Buchanan and why Nick had to write it all down and tell the story. So let me jump into showing some pictures real quick. Um, all right, we'll get to that image in a second. So just if I could, part of, um, part of my process is on the first day, I will have drafted something a little bit formal to read to the, um, to the cast that would orient us, basically like the essential intent of the production. And for me, um, it's this, this section orange here, by sharing a story with us, by making us himself vulnerable despite his discomfort and pain, Nick has, Nick has come here to this theater on this night in the presence of this perishable moment to be seen, to find that connection, to find that love, to experience empathy, to be alive in the moment. He needs the audience's help in order to get the hidden monsters out in the open. Um, for me, the, the, the thing that tied all these characters together was this overwhelming sense of shame hmm. that people were not comfortable in their own skin that they felt that there was something wrong with them and either took it out on the world or themselves uh, so uh you know these processes began with gathering images working off of maureen's um uh, uh ideas of water the water theme this idea of a sunken ship of of uh Gatsby's eventual drowning, um, trying to find a vocabulary for a world that's not going to compete with the explosiveness of Baz Luhrmann. Mm. Um, and what I think we ended up with is a, a kind of Gatsby in the minor key. And um, this became our set. Uh, our set was this giant um, gesture of 
of Gatsby's home painted blue, like the blue lawns outside of his, his, um, his house, blue, like the sunken ship picture I showed you before, um, very much like an artifice in the space, not trying to be real, realistic. Um, that you have to have the billboard of TJ Eckelberg. I, I don't think you could really do Gatsby without it, but I, I bring this up because the eyes modeled in the billboard were actually based on the actor who played Nick Carraway. So the, his eyes were the eyes overlooking the production, overlooking the action of the play. And so one way of, uh, of not, uh, of avoiding trying to compete with uh, the spectacle that is the film is, you know, how do you go more metaphoric? How do you go more um, elemental and try to reduce these events to like their most essential potent components. So this is an image of Nick arriving at the first party and it sort of explodes in this um, uh, flurry of movement and light. Um, we wanted to base it off of this is Nick's experience of what's going on. Um, you know, and then I was really wanted to have the play motivated by actor movement. So this is the bay between Gatsby's, um, uh, Gatsby's home and Daisy's uh, created with fabric. Um, those lights from the party uh, ascending to become the lights that are, um, uh, that become the stars and one of them descending to become the green light on the other side of the bay. Uh, unfortunately, one of the lights was out when we took this picture, but <laughs> Gatsby's car, instead of wheeling a car on stage, um, having it created by the ensemble so that everything is um, a manifestation that's taking shape in front of us. I described it to our cast as, you know, if, if Nick has a poetic soul, um, this, this world is going to feel dreamlike or, or nightmarish, depending on where we are in the story. And again, this is like Gatsby and, and Daisy's fateful meeting at Nick's cottage. Uh, this center doorway became this portal where a number of things appeared. So one moment there was nothing behind there and the next moment there was uh, his hulking wardrobe. Uh, when George Wilson decides to, that he's going to go kill the person who killed Myrtle, we open the doors and there's a giant eye from the billboard behind it uh, looming over the proceedings. Um, and then as the play moved on, we really leaned into uh, what Maureen really brings out in her book too, is that there's a very noir aspect to the book that I, I hadn't read in my first uh, go at it, but leaning into that visual aesthetic. And then, great. So then this is getting into my like favorite sequence of, of our production, which is Gatsby's death, um, him diving down underneath the pool. And then after he is uh, shot by Wilson, this image as the, of the light coming back down and just being out of grasp. For me, this is like, how, how do I boil down the story of The Great Gatsby into a single lasting image for the audience? And then the very last thing I wanted to say just about the casting of Gatsby, uh, uh, who's on the right, um, Eddie Sanchez was our Gatsby. He's um, uh, 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 a Mexican-American, uh, first generation go to college. His, um, his father was a, a farmer. Um, and it wasn't until late into the process that he really talked to me about, like one of the things he recognized uh, where Gatsby was a part of him was that it wasn't until college that he really embraced his own heritage, that he spent so much time trying in, um, in high school to achieve what he called like a, 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 a kind of whiteness, mm -hmm. like what being like everybody else and not feeling at home in his own skin. So in playing Gatsby, he brought that element of his own personal experience to it which then really under um, put some strong undercurrents under the, the lines in the, in the Plaza Hotel when Jordan says, we're all white here. You know, here's this guy who, who is pretending, trying to pass, um, trying to be not just rich, but in the class of whiteness. Yeah. 
It's so powerful. And, and I, 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 I feel embarrassed by all the plugs you gave to my book, Michael, but <laughs> I'm not a visual person. And when I see it, I see these images and, and how you've interpreted certain themes. It's um, to me, it's just mind blowing. It's so beautiful. Uh, Ni, I, I, I have to turn to you because you're, you're one of the first people who've, who've taken the democratic possibilities of the absence of copyright and you run with it. And um, I told you before this webinar began that my students and I have just jumped into chapter one of Gatsby, rereading it. And we, you know, those of us who've read The Chosen and Beautiful love so much the way you've literalized that famous image of, of Jordan and Daisy sitting in the Buchanan living room. And Fitzgerald describes them so beautifully as almost like floating. Well, you, you have them floating because this is kind of fantasy, um, a, a fantasy version of Gatsby, but also a nightmare version uh, given what your Jordan Baker experiences. Can we just take a look um, before I ask you to talk about The Chosen and, and the Beautiful, can we take a look, uh, Patty, at the slide we have of Edith Cummings, who was the inspiration for Jordan Baker. She was known as the Flareway, Fairway Flapper, and she was a close friend of Ginevra Kings, who uh, Fitzgerald scholars know was F. Scott Fitzgerald's first love. So. Um, there is that Jordan Baker and me. <laughs> I would I would love to hear you talk about your Jordan Baker, um, who who looks and has a life that's very different from the life of Edith Cummings. Of course. Um, my entry into writing about Jordan Baker, uh, as I told your students earlier, came from a piece of the dialogue where Nick describes her as a young woman with a soldier-like tilt to her shoulders. It's it's an incredibly evocative image. It's incredibly, um, it, it's an image that sticks with you. It sticks, it stuck with me among other things because immediately there was an image of who Jordan was and who Nick saw her as being. And then there was also the stunning realization that who Nick sees her as is not necessarily the real Jordan any more than um, the Gatsby that he sees is the real Gatsby or the Daisy he sees is the real Daisy. And once you start thinking about who Jordan is, or at least once I started thinking about who Jordan is, and the more research I did into women in the era and the more research that I put into even what Daisy was going through, the more you realize that there's an entire story there underneath the original story that has been alluded to but hasn't ever uh, been pried up or was not explored in the original narrative. Um, as, uh, as you said, um, Jordan probably takes her roots from uh, Edith Cummings. And then, and so that started me looking into women in sports in the 1920s. Women were um, not allowed to play professional golf in the era. They, um, they could play independently. Uh, they had their own matches but there was no recognition of women as professional golfers. So that's a place that Jordan comes from. Another place that Jordan comes from is the fact that white women, as of the writing of The Great Gatsby, have only had the vote for two years. And as I was talking about this with uh, with my agent, Diana Fox, um, she said, Me, do you really think that Daisy Buchanan votes? And I'm like, I know she does not. Uh, Jordan herself, uh, um, the version that I have, uh, who's queer, Asian American, uh, foreign born, uh, she, is not allowed to vote and it's not something she ever thinks about uh, because she doesn't let herself think about it but all that comes together to make an incredibly fertile ground for both creating my own narrative but also lending to my understanding of the original novel yeah yeah i i i love the way kind of the theme of fluidity is is moving through um all of these works and i want to get to talking with blake about the graphic novel that's just come out um but I mean, you're talking about sort of um, sexual fluidity as well as the fluidity between fantasy and reality in this world that you've given us of, of Gatsby. And Michael, I mean, just those sets with, with kind of the watery fluid imagery that's going, what is it about Gatsby? This is a weird novel. And um, I, I think it's a novel that invites what you've done, me, kind of this entry into a, a world that you make even more artificial in some ways, because 
the world of Gatsby is, is so strange and arranged almost like an art deco design. It, it, perhaps I'm, I'm rambling here, but I, 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 it's a weird novel. <laughs> uh, Jay Gatsby is the fun and the beauty of transgression, like through class, through sex, through gender. Yeah. And um, why wouldn't we pick up on that? We, we're yeah. in a very fluid moment in history. And uh, those, are, those are all values that I think we're invested in at the moment. Yes, yes. Would you, um, I'd, like, I'd love for people to hear a bit from The Chosen and the Beautiful. So would you, would you just read the opening? Of course. Me? The wind came into the house from the sound and it blew Daisy and me around her East Egg Mansion like puffs of dandelion seeds, like foam, like a pair of young women in white dresses who had no cares to weigh them down. It was only June, but summer had already lay heavy on the ground, threatening to press us softly and heavily towards the parquet floors. We could not stand to go down to the water where the salt air was heavier still, and a long drive into the city felt like an offensive impossibility. Instead, Daisy cracked open a small charm she had purchased on a whim in Cannes a few short years ago. The charm was made of baked clay in the shape of a woman, and when Daisy broke it to crumbling bits in her fingers, it released the basement smell of fresh cowlin clay, mixed with something dark green and herbal. There was a gust of wind of a different kind, and then we were airborne, moving with languid grace along the high ceilings of her house, and exclaiming at the strangeness and the secrets we found there. A single flick of our hands or feet sent us skimming through the air, at first adrift, and then with surges of speed as we pushed away from the mantles and the columns. It's wonderful. I had to reread that opening twice to say, wait, is she really doing that? And then it made me think of the, the Queensboro Bridge scene, which many people remember because that's such a, I don't know, a signal moment in the novel when Nick and, and Gatsby are driving over the Queensboro Bridge. And, and Nick says, you know, that the, the skyline of New York in 1922, which is the present time of the novel, it, it, it's almost like it's an impossibility. And he says, once you go over this bridge, anything can happen, even Gatsby can happen. I mean, that's what I mean about the novel seeming almost to open the door to these more fantastic possibilities that, that you've explored. Um, Blake, I, wanted, I want to talk about the graphic novel that um, Scribner's has, has put out and that you've worked on um, and, and just talk about some of these images that the artist Aya Morton has uh, chose and you know, what you know about how these images came together with the text of the novel. It's, I feel uh, like I'm jarring coming out of me's dream. I, it's like, <laughs> I, I wanna sort of stay floating in the <laughs> world, that's beautiful. Um, but uh, okay, so the graphic novel, we, um, I was very, very lucky to work with Scribner on the graphic novel version of Gatsby, um, you know, being aware that we were coming up on copyright expiration, we did, um, we were very fortunate to um, be able to think and be thoughtful, be uh, deliberate about doing some things um, before we went into public domain. One of them was doing a graphic novel. Um, Nan, Graham, and Kara Watson at Scribner were both very excited about doing one. There was just this sort of moment when we all thought, okay, this is it, this is the time, let's do it. And so we actually went out and found an illustrator and a text adapter. Um, and one of my favorite parts of it was going with Nan and Kara into bookshops in New York and looking at graphic novels going, what, do you like this shape? Do you like these colors? Do you like this? You know, it was really, really incredibly fun and creative process. But um, I eventually actually in a bookshop here in LA uh, happened upon um, His Dream of the Skyland, which is a graphic novel that I illustrated. And immediately the images were just, I mean, breathtaking, stunning, and just seemed so apropos. And I sent it to everyone and we all agreed that Aya was perfect. We approached her. She immediately said yes, um, which was fabulous. I mean, it was just such a great partnership from the very start. At that same time, I was looking at, um, you know, we were researching and I, I came across Fred Fordham's To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and he illustrated and text adapted to, to his own version of To Kill a Mockingbird. It was totally stunning. I mean, beautiful. He did a wonderful job. And I um, thought he would do a great text adaptation. He just has a kind of um, sense of nuance and, and the beats, of course, from having, from being a, an illustrator himself. 
Um, so he worked really closely with that. Anyway, I, uh, we asked him if he would do the text adaptation, adaptation. He immediately said yes. And he was willing to work with an illustrator and not do the illustration himself, which I think was probably actually hard for a visual artist. Um, but he was gracious about it. And anyway, so we worked together, I would say Kara and Aya and Fred and I worked very intensely over a period of, I guess, a few months. Honestly, Aya uh, illustrated the graphic novel with such speed. I can't even believe how beautiful and um, detailed and rich it is. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's how it came to be. Um, and then now I don't remember the original question about it, but that's how, that's, <laughs> That's how we got it, uh, it going. And then unfortunately, um, you know, it came out just as so many of our projects and things were about to launch into the world. And so we haven't really had a chance to do any kind of like book tours or things like that. And so this is wonderful to be able to talk about the graphic novel with, with you all. Um, Can we see some images? Yes, um, I'm terrible at screen sharing, but I will do that right now. Um, okay, first of all, let me know if I'm yeah. successfully screen sharing. Is that working? It is. You, well, you've overcome your screen sharing uh, trepidation. It's really well. Wonderful. Thank you for practicing with me before this. <laughs> um, OK, so here is a party scene, clearly. Um, more party imagery. This is Daisy down in the lower right. Um, all of the chapters have these beautiful um, pieces, um, opening pieces, uh, and you can see, so you can kind of see some of how Fred chose to adapt the text. I mean, I j just did an amazing job of um, making an already very concise work even more concise. I mean, I think that's really hard to do, and he did a wonderful job. I, I read an interview that Aya gave, I think, to the Fitzgerald Society, and she talked about um, and I think you've talked about this, wanting to sort of step away from the Art Deco look that's so much associated with the 1920s. And instead um, that she went to the original sources of magazines from the era and tried to get the, the look that was the look then, not the way, the look that we superimpose on that era, which I, th I think is, um, I don't know, lends a power to this, to this version of Gatsby. Definitely, I agree. Um, and just her visual research was so, I mean, I just wanted to spend time in her archives and um, the things when we would do calls with her in the background, um, just totally beautiful references. And it makes sense that she, I mean, she essentially designed all of these costumes and things. I mean, it's incredible. It's its really a lot when you think about it, the wallpaper designs, the cars, the clothes that it's just an incredible hair styles everything I mean she was very period accurate but not campy in any way not um well just as you say I mean very accurate but light and beautiful I love what she did yeah yeah fluid yeah <laughs> yeah word um yeah terrific okay I'll switch it <laughs> I, I I I'm gonna go from these beautiful, airy, fluid images um, to, to a, a, a final question I want to throw out, throw out to all of you because I can see once again, we're kind of running out of time and I do want to leave um, some space for the audience to, to pose some questions. Throughout the, this semester, as I've been rereading Fitzgerald with my students and we've been approaching Gatsby, and, you know, we're sitting in a classroom where we're all wearing masks and it's a little weird. And it's, it all, especially at the beginning of the semester, it, there was the sense of you never knowing week to week how many people would be in class, what was going on in the world. So a lot of anxiety. Um, a word that keeps coming up in class, especially now about Gatsby and maybe particularly about Nick is the word trauma that um, Nick sounds as though maybe he, he's traumatized by his experience in World War I. Maybe this is a traumatized generation. And I think, you know, a lot of culture critics have made that connection between the 1920s and our present time. And they've also reached to the great Gatsby as being this novel about restlessness and anxiety and 
Um, Sarah Churchwell wrote a fabulous essay, I think, in the New York Review of Books in 2020 called The Oracle of Our Unease about F. Scott Fitzgerald and about May Day, about Bernice Bob's her hair, about Gatsby, and just the way Fitzgerald managed to touch on these anxieties about race, about eugenics, about um, socialism, about uh, women getting the vote and what that would mean. And just this notion of a society that's not fixed anymore and, and how that comes through in Gatsby. So that's a long lead up to my question of, um, doesn't, doesn't this seem I mean, to be the right time maybe for Gatsby to come out of copyright because we need it so much now. We need to, we need to embrace it in different ways now because it's, it's really a novel that I think really speaks to an uneasy time. I don't know, I feel like I'm strong arming you to agree with me, but we keep talking about this in class and it's a way in which the novel is being made new in our class this time around, um, that it that it hasn't been um, made new in this particular way before. So I don't know if, if anybody wants to talk to, to that or we'll just turn to questions. <laughs> I mean, I would say, oh, sorry. No, 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 go ahead, Nia, I'd love to. Okay, um, when, you, when you spoke about that, that sounds so much this idea that I've been wrestling with in, with in my head, which is the relationship between beauty and trauma. The idea that being beautiful, um, the idea of becoming beautiful, being a type of trauma, aesthetics as trauma. And you know what we come away with uh, from um, Fitzgerald's novel is it's such a beautiful novel. It is, a, it's a, it is an aesthetic novel, it is a novel that visually and emotionally inspires. And what is the connection of pain to that beauty, and um, I think it. I think it's all intertwined, and I think that as we move forward, I love the idea of um, beauty actually pairing back and showing off the pain that is a part of that. And I think if you know, in my head, that's what I see as moving towards the future of this narrative. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let me jump in with with two things. Like one. I think what's interesting though about this book is that I, I had a meeting two weeks ago with a theater company about something and, 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 you know, just uh, nonchalantly, I was pitching like, you know, great Gatsby, you know, like we could do something and it wasn't even necessarily to do a production, but it was like a curriculum component of having students re-engage with the book through their lens. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, it's, it was interesting because the immediate, the immediate pushback, I couldn't even get the idea out of my mouth because I think there's a misconception from my point of view of like what this book is about. It's about rich white people yeah. doing rich white people things. Yeah. And I think like maybe when I was in high school reading in 2003, that maybe was my takeaway of it, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I think there's an opportunity now to go to this book. I think it's always been there, but I think instead of codifying, like, what is it that Fitzgerald meant or what this symbol means this and like it, it is opening it up and looking at it through these lenses and like just say, looking at it through the lens of race, let's just say Jordan Baker is not a white woman. Let's just say, like, let's just say if we look at it through these perspectives of questions that they were wrestling with then that we're still wrestling with now, mm -hmm. what, what could open up? Um, and, but also to the question of trauma, like one of the things that me really, that, that popped out, like a small moment that really popped out for me, because in my reading of it, like Nick is super primary and why he's telling the story, but there's a moment in your book where you say, um, everyone's sitting around the table gossiping about Gatsby and uh, you know, that he killed a man, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Jordan's the only one perceptive enough to really realize, like, Nick's probably the only person at this party who has actually killed a person, you know, in war. And, and it's just, like, for me, like, one, it's great to see, like, this adjacent novel bring this new understanding to the original book by pointing out that single, that single thing. 
but also that yeah like nick is got a story that we never see because he is in so much control over what we do see his words are so uh he's such an architect of the story he even says that he, he goes back home and puts some distance behind it so he can put the world in order again um which means that at some point it was not in order for him yeah. and then if you start to read like where like how much Fitzgerald wrestled with his own writing for me like that's another thing that you can't um divorce from the book is that there is that struggle of the artist and the creation of it to make it this beautiful thing but it took like this forging like this crucible in order to get this condensed dense novel yeah yeah Lake, I'm going to give you the last word, fittingly. Uh, uh, I mean, I, th I think that Michael and me spoke so well to trauma and pain in this moment. Um, and really, I just, you know, when you spoke of uncertainty and this and Gatsby coming out of copyright, I think for those of us who've been sort of a safe uh, safeguard or the, no, I wouldn't say gatekeeper, I don't know, although that, that term came up before, it's funny. Um, but maybe we, our, our charge has been to protect the text. Um, it's been, it is like a moment when we've had to um, embrace the unknown and say, yeah. let's, you know, let's see what people do. Let's, let's, I mean, it's exciting actually to see, I mean, it's incredibly exciting to see Mee's novel and to realize that something truly writerly will come out of, you know, it's, you imagine people, I, it's hard not to imagine that people may do things that aren't as thoughtful, you know, and Mee's work could stand on its own. It doesn't, she didn't need Gatsby to do it, you know, and I think that in the past, I've kind of imagined that a lot of prequels or sequels would use Gatsby as a jumping off point because maybe they weren't strong enough in themselves, you know what I mean? And yeah. so it's actually really wonderful to see something so full um, come, come to life this way. So embracing the unknown is also kind of like part of this moment, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then also, you know, just, I mean, the way that we've been able to kind of um, meet the moment in terms of um, Fitzgerald's text, you know, working with Scribner to create some um, authoritative versions. Um, often, actually almost entire, almost all of the novels I would say have, uh, are using the Cambridge Variorum Vary 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 text that James L. West III has um, worked tirelessly on just restoring uh, some of the manuscripts, some uh, removing Britishisms, things like that, and, and really uh, creating a beautiful um, text that we can always go back to. So no matter how, how wild you know, we get, um, that we can always come back to the text. And Scribner has done a beautiful job of safeguarding the text in that, in that way. And um, you know, so you can always come back to those versions. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I, in the interest of uh, getting a few questions in here from the audience, I'm going to turn to Patty Guzman, who's generously agreed to look through these questions and pose some to us. Sure. Um, we have a question that's actually related to the conversation that we've already been talking about. Um, Jose is, asks, I wonder how the way readers read Gatsby for example, as a love story, as a critique of the American dream, as a treasure hunt for symbols, as a stylistic matter, masterpiece, et cetera, has changed over time and how you anticipate readers will be reading Gatsby in the future. How might current and future concerns and events such as the accelerating widening of income and wealth inequality and the COVID-19 pandemic inform future readings of Gatsby? Mm. Yeah. That's I, I just want to put in a plug, um, and maybe we can I can get it in the chat uh, quickly for Sarah Churchwell's article, which is floating out there on the internet. It's from the New York Review of Books, um, 2020, and it's called The Oracle of Our Unease. And it speaks to so many of those issues about how Fitzgerald, especially is talking about income inequality and, racial unrest, and it's not forced. Um, Churchwell is a Fitzgerald scholar, and she really kind of teases out what's already in these texts. So um, that's my plug. I think that moving forward, I think there's going to be this splendid atmosphere of suspicion for the novel, which I think is will only make it stronger. And we're going to start like, um, uh, as uh, Marina's talked about in her book, So We Read On, the idea of 
you know, the early lack of success that the Great Gatsby enjoyed into its uh, sort of ad adoption during World War II in, the, uh, in a program that saw it sent to a wide variety of US servicemen overseas as part of their entertainment bundle. Um, that's a hard thing to predict, but I think that, you know, going from um, when the novel entered the world, uh, you know, through the depression, people were not eager to read about the exploits of the rich and wealthy. By the 40s, it became this really beautiful bit of nostalgia. And as we move forward, I think we'll be reading it with suspicion. And also that same, same kind of pleasure that does come from reading about things that are gone and beautiful. Hmm. I like that word, suspicion. That's, that's <laughs> a nice way to approach any text, I think. <laughs> Patty, can, can we hear a few more questions? Um, sure. Um, the next question is from um, a high school English teacher. Uh, John asks, who, um, he says he'll be teaching Gatsby again next month. What approach do you, do you each think I should take to introducing the novel to first time readers so as to avoid it feeling like coerced symbol hunting? Yeah, I definitely want to jump in on this one. So I think, I think there's an opportunity for students as part of a curriculum to, to make the book their own. Now, I come from a theater background, so I would say, you know, taking, taking a piece from the book and uh, adapting it in some way. Like, um, you know, if you've got musicians in your class or you've got actors in your class or you've got a visual artist in your class, you know, trying to get them to find like what of the book speaks to them now um how does it re how does the relation um and really like the conversation about identity throughout the the book like where do they connect with that um where do they connect on the larger themes um you know the the whole curriculum i was going to pitch before it was sort of squashed was was that was that exact idea is like taking taking the book and you know working with students to have them generate their own material. So their response is an artistic response to this, you know, wonderful jumping off place. And then through that, it doesn't become sort of like this thing that we put up on a pedestal that has a lot of rules to it, but it becomes something that you can enter into and then come out the other side of it, knowing something about the book, but knowing something about yourself. Here's another question. What, challenge, what challenges do you foresee continuing the legacy of Gatsby now that it entered the public domain? As it becomes more malleable, will people still care? I, I can't imagine a time when they wouldn't care, but maybe I'm an idealist about this. Uh, if we didn't become super saturated after Baz Luhrmann's version, I, I, th I think there's hope. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm uh, I'm a little down on that version. I think Leonardo DiCaprio was way too confident to play Gatsby. So. <laughs> I think it's our nature to fall fall in love with things, and I think Gatsby is both the novel and the character himself is super easy to fall in love with. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think going back to the high school question a little bit, I um, I think maybe listening to students and hearing what themes come up for them would be really, really helpful as we do move into, I mean, I was just before the pandemic, I spoke in a high school and um, students came up afterwards and their burning question was, do I think Nick was gay? And I was like, this is fascinating. Like, of course, I mean, there have been um, certainly readings of the text that have, you know, like um, explored that idea. And I personally think, I mean, I don't know what happens after he's in the elevator coming down from the party, but waking up in his underwear <laughs> in a man's bedroom. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe, but um, I think the themes can kind of come out that maybe feel fresh for a new generation and really listening to that and being open to them could be, could be great with high school students. Here's a fun question. Which character from Gatsby does each panelist wish would get their own spin-off story to find out more about their backstory? 
TJ Eckelberg, man. Like, <laughs> like, what's his deal? Did, did did he open up this spectacle business and it and, and it went asunder? Like, you know, how much did he pay for that billboard? I mean, he put it up in the middle of nowhere. Who did he think was going to come? I think there's a whole comedic backstory to be told about TJ Eckelberg that he has no idea how much he's had an impact on people's lives just by putting up a giant billboard in the middle of like what looks like the apocalypse. <laughs> I vote for the Finnish woman who cleans Nick's cottage and who mutters <laughs> things in Finnish under her breath that he doesn't understand. I think she could tell us a lot. <laughs> Mr. McKee, he's, you know, he's got the elevator scene, but he's a man who's got a lot going on. <laughs> I love that. I th it's interesting how, I think Jordan is very, uh, she's, she, I think people are really drawn to yeah. her as someone who may not be uh, Edith Cummings, you know, he, who may not, who may actually have a, a very different story. I mean, I think, I think she's a totally compelling character. And, um, but in a sense, I think they're all, I've heard people use the word underwritten to describe Gatsby as a character. And I know that Scott went back and forth with his editor, Max Perkins, about writing more detail into Gatsby. You know, um, Max Perkins wanted him to, to tell us, to tell the reader more. And Scott didn't want to, but he did do, he did add in some, some more color, some more information. But I think in a way, all of these characters are these wonderful foils. You can imagine so many things about them in their lives. It's no wonder that we want to hear what their what might have happened to them before and in some cases after the story that we see. So I I mean now that now that it's all sort of out in the open, I, I can't wait to see what people do with any of the characters. I'll be curious. <laughs> yeah. Um I, we might be able to squeeze in one more question <laughs> if we talk fast. Maybe I can just end with um, a student comment from um, one of your students in your honors thesis class who said that they could not agree more with the idea that um, returning to Fitzgerald has been important during this time, during the pandemic experience. Well, that's, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Patty, for your help. Thank you, amazing panelists. Um, I wish I wish we could get off of these screens and go to a bar somewhere and talk about Gatsby all night, but we can't. And thank you to to everyone who's who's joined us on this webinar. Um, it's really been a pleasure. Stay safe, everyone, and keep reading Gatsby. Right. <laughs> thank you.